pointed right at you. <laughs> okay, then. So uh, I'm supposed to do the introduction, everything tonight, I've been told. So. So if you are here for MMII credit, uh, make sure that you fill out a registration form and leave it at the table. And if you need an extra credit slip, those are at the table as well. And I'm assuming that all of you are here because you already maybe know what MMII is or you just want the extra credit, one of the two of them. But if you're just here for the extra credit, then I would recommend that you actually uh, sign up for the MMII credit anyway. Uh, how many of you have been trying to work on a certificate? All right, one person. Well, that's okay. But uh, so who has never even heard of that before? Okay, so three people. So actually, MMII is the Macomb Multicultural and International Initiatives, and if you go to 20 hours worth of events, you can get a, a cultural competency certificate that you can put on your uh, resume or wherever you want, and it, and it goes on your transcript as well, and you can finish it even after you aren't a student here. You can get one even if you aren't a student here. Anyone can get it, and it, I, um, honestly, I... I know that it, it tends to look good on a resume, especially with uh, everything going on in the world today that you took some time out of your life to learn more about another culture and things around you in the world. And so that's what this program is about. And you can get up to a level three certificate now. So every 20 hours, you can get a level uh, up in a certificate. So. Uh, it's a free program, and that, you know, that, that's part of why I'm here, because I actually um, am very much in support of uh, things like this. So now on to the presentation of what, what I actually know is a, an $80 or so book. <laughs> so this, this actually is a very difficult book to find, A Russian Childhood by Sophia Kov well, this guy, yeah. actually, uh, in my not-so-good Russian accent, and very slow because I have not had any Russian lessons in probably like 10 years, but, uh, but uh, th this actually is an interesting book. How many of you did read it? All right, one person. That's okay. Did anyone from the internet read it? Probably not. I, I can look at your faces and see that. It doesn't look like you have read it either. So I came up with some items to talk about regarding the book. But if there's anything that uh, you think of that uh, you want to ask about, feel free. But uh, the book is very interesting because the introduction takes up about 25% of the book. And then her mathematical and scientific contribution take up about the last 25% of the book. So the middle 50% of the book is her personal diary and reflections and uh, things things like that. So um, if you read the introduction, you'll find out that those chapters, no one even is guaranteed that they're in the right order because two of the chapters were actually missing at some point because when they were translated into English from Russian, uh, some people lost two of the chapters originally. So, so this is actually very interesting uh, because it, it really sums up this, this woman's life that something like this would actually happen to her. So right, I'm actually formatted the, my sort of topics I want to talk about sort of in the ups and downs of Sophia's life. So I'm going to tell you something positive and then immediately follow it by something negative that happened. And this will be pretty much the trend of her entire life. So um, Sophia actually was uh, quoted by a famous historian as being the greatest known woman scientist before the 20th century. And it sort of is true. And uh, the, the book really, as I mentioned, isn't uh, Major, the majority of it isn't really about her scientific endeavors, but it's more about her life and her thoughts and how those thoughts 
actually played into her being a mathematician and a scientist. So, so let's let's start with the uh, the positives. Like she she was born, right? I mean, that's a positive thing because if she wasn't born, then uh, all these uh, great sort of discoveries wouldn't have been made. But that was in 1850, and then when she was eight years old, her father, who was a general in the Russian uh, Imperial Army at the time actually retired and so they went to the family estate and she had a very good childhood education because she was tutored privately in elementary school mathematics so um, you know like it seemed like for the time that she lived that she had a pretty good upbringing a general uh, daughter right and and she uh, could have the homeschooling, but then the bad thing. When she was 13, her father put a stop to all mathematics tutoring because, and this was sort of uh, the setting for everything that happened because he didn't like that she wanted to learn algebra because in, in his words, he didn't believe in learned women. Now, learned women, like that, that's an antiquated phrase for so many reasons and, and definitely I also think that part of it might be uh, that I actually uh, believe that the phrase is probably even worse than that but that just the way that translated and we just don't have the, the words in, in English to um, describe what he actually wanted to say like I really don't want uh, any woman to become smarter than me, and I noticed, but he was smart enough to realize she was becoming smarter by learning algebra. So that's the sort of the ironic part. Like, if he wanted to outsmart her, then why didn't he try to learn algebra himself? I mean, that's sort of like, where where is that logic going? So I, that was one of the, the down points for her. But then on the upside, she continued to learn math on her own. And so one of her neighbors was a physicist. And uh, so if you know, does anyone know the sines and cosines and, or, or heard of them maybe? Or like just a, it basically an up and down wave, up and down wave. So what she did was she actually drew little line segments so to approximate the, the curve. And it and I, I think that uh, this is a basic mathematical concept that a lot of people can get, that if you draw enough little line segments together, they can actually even look like a circle, and you won't even know it, right? I mean, that's how a, a computer draws a circle. So they draw a lot of little line segments uh, uh, close together, and then it looks like a circle, even though it's really not. So uh, she realized that she could do that, and so... The neighbor, the physicist, called her the new Pascal. Does anyone know who Pascal is? All right. Well, Pascal, and this is sort of another reason why I like these sort of historical math events. And and every semester we have these. But last uh, last fall, one of the uh, presentations was about Pascal and. Uh, he's an actually interesting guy, and um, and all of these mathematicians tend to have some drama in their life at some point, especially some of these ancient ones, and actually some of the modern ones, even if you've uh, seen any of the famous movies recently, like uh, even uh, recently that are about mathematicians, like A Beautiful Mind or something like that. There, there's always some drama behind how they became a mathematician. So this doesn't surprise me at all that this, this happened. So here's a, a question that I have for all of you, and I, I would sort of like to hear your responses. And you can either uh, say it really loudly, or I can, I can walk over to you. And you can hand talk into the microphone a little bit more closely. It's up to you. But I'm sort of, after this part of, her her life just wondering is there a 
time that you can think of that um, that you were actually good at mathematics because if, if you think about it right I mean the, the stereotype today is that people aren't necessarily good at mathematics or they're they're scared of mathematics but back then that wasn't actually the stereotype it, because it was actually a positive thing to to um, be good at mathematics because um, uh, education was valued a little bit differently at that time because it wasn't as accessible to everyone. And also, let's see, where, well, I, I actually did read an article, it was about two days ago, that was, and so this issue is still coming up, but about two days ago that said that even the people who say that they have the biggest fear of mathematics still actually have this one time they can remember that they were good at mathematics and then there was that turning point for them. And so I'm wondering, even if you don't want to address that question specifically, like maybe what you think may have been uh, Sophia's motivation for still wanting to learn mathematics even though she was being told that her tutor was uh, being taken away from her, and uh, she had to steal an algebra book just to keep on learning. And uh, well, does anyone have any uh, thoughts about that, or want to share about why they think that she may have wanted to continue learning math, or maybe their own experience that might relate to this? Or, no, no. school student now. It's a long break and now I'm back in school. Yep, yeah, my yep. Yeah. And I so I does anyone get that sense that that's actually what was happening with her? Like like she was just like in the eighteen sixties and there wasn't much to do and so when she started looking at this stuff she just felt satisfied to uh, to do these problems. There's a lot of mathematics involved in like timing and stuff. I used to watch it. I used to watch like the and timing and stuff going around. There's a lot of bigger mathematics involved in that. Oh yeah, yeah. I I and see that I feel like that gets back to my other point about like Sophia's relationship with her dad, right? I mean, he he could have he could have done the math along with her instead of like fighting her about it. And so for you No volume. When did that happen? I hope it didn't happen very long ago. No. <laughs> okay. No. Uh, oh. I hope that wasn't very long ago. See, no one actually. See, you guys aren't even watching them. <coughs> oh, 
Uh, yeah, I, well, yeah, no, no. All right. Well, if you didn't hear anything, then that's okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, I, well, no. Yeah, well, no. It's not that we don't like you guys. I only actually noticed that anything was wrong because I saw a big flashing uh, 30 chat messages, and I can't actually see the messages. All right. And I actually didn't press any buttons, so I don't know how this got turned off. So it may be somewhere in the fury of me, like, uh, like, talking about, yeah, probably, talking about her and her, um, you know, her family, uh, but this is a twisted family, right? I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, like, I mean, I think that she ended up being a, like, a, a very su successful woman, but now, here's what really happened to her, All right, so, does anyone have any other thoughts on that? All right, so, so, even though she did actually go and she um, and she uh, went and, and saw what was wrong with her sister and everything, right? And then she went back to Berlin to study for three more years, right? She still became miserable, and she still was exhausted, and she still was depressed. And remember, though that this was a fictitious marriage, but the theory is that all these feelings of depression was, were because she was away from her husband. Right? So she was actually, yeah, she was actually falling for this guy. And so she was, it, because remember that even though this was a fake husband, when uh, her sister was in, in trouble, yeah, he came with her, too, to the Paris Commune because uh, he actually wrote a letter that said that uh, Sophia and her sister are my kin now, too. I'm married to her, and so they are my kin now, too, so I have to go. If, if they are going, I am going, or, or I will go and save her sister's illegal husband even if they don't go. So that's why he actually gave the fake passport away because he really just felt strongly that that they were all family at that point and so she was following for him all right so then she finally did oh by the way i i wrote i made a note about this because um i i don't normally do this but my my furnace actually has been out for uh two weeks now and it actually got repaired this morning but i i was sort of just uh thinking about life and i i looked up my my horoscope which i never usually do but and it said you'll need to decide whether it's worth following your heart or doing your duty it may not be possible to do both and I'm like this is exactly what happened to this lady right she had to decide whether she should do her duty to save her sister or whether she should follow her heart and her hope and her dreams and finish her degree in mathematics so anyway this is just a uh, uh, very strange timing that this i don't actually think that the horoscope applies to me but it applied to her life so uh, so sometimes uh, different things like that come up and you're just like this applies somewhere but i don't know where and so um, eventually she did actually present her three papers, as I mentioned earlier, to receive her PhD from the uh, University of Göttingen. And then uh, her, <laughs> her topics were on partial differential equations and then on um, dynamics of Saturn's rings and elliptical integrals. And, and so she ended up being the first woman uh, woman to obtain a doctorate in mathematics from a European university. But then you would think that's all good. She finally achieved her dream. She survived the Paris Commune. But then she returned to Russia, and her husband couldn't get a job due to his radical beliefs. And she couldn't get a job because she was a woman in, in, in Russia. So they... They were back in Russia. They couldn't find jobs. So what do they do? They tried to they tried to build houses because her her husband was told that building houses would make them a lot of money. 
Well, the real estate uh, the real estate field turned sour, and then and then her husband got involved with the oil company, but they end up having to file for bankruptcy. So I, I don't think it could get any worse than this for her, right? I mean, because she, her family was loaded because uh, her father was a retired general from the Russian Imperial Army, but she didn't have any of his money because he still didn't have her blessing because that's why she was out there on that fake marriage. So she couldn't get that money. And then now they're bankrupt, so it couldn't get much worse for her until 1875 when uh, those feelings I was telling you about actually did come true and uh, Vladimir and Sophia t decided to turn their fictitious marriage into a real one. And uh, she asked him, like, why didn't you want to be in a real marriage before? And he was afraid that uh, if she got pregnant, that that would put an end to her studies. And he didn't want her to do that. Like, he wanted to study paleontology. He knew she wanted to study math. So she um, did that, and he let her go on her own way. And then he also felt like he might be a bad father because he couldn't hold down a job. I mean, he already went, he was going bankrupt, so he's like, I, I can't hold down a job. Uh, I, I don't want you to get pregnant, and then you can't finish your degree. So what, what actually happened then? Well, you would think that it's a, a good thing that, that they overcame all of that and that uh, they finally got married, but then Sophia decided, well, you you – wanted me to continue on, on my work of doing mathematics, but now I'm just going to randomly stop. And she didn't really give any explanation. She just stopped. So uh, th there's some theories like overexhaustion, uh, setting unattainable goals, but not taking pleasure in when they actually uh, pan out, or just her own internal fear of success, or just uh, knowing that you know, even if she did more math, she still wouldn't be allowed to ever teach in Russia. So why should she do more math if she never is going to get her job of being a professor that she really wanted? So, I mean, do you always really see from what I've told you about her so far that she might have that fear of success from her upbringing because she was told, like, you you have to steal a book illegal, you know, be illegal and just learning mathematics because I'm not going to pay for your tutor anymore. So when she is successful, she doesn't recognize it. So I, to me, that says something about her, her also. So does anyone have any comments on that? Or maybe um, not even on that or how it relates to her story, but um, maybe there are other theories on why she may have just all of a sudden walked away from studying math or maybe in general reasons why you or someone else may have given up something important out of nowhere and, and why things like that might happen. So, yeah, fr oh yeah, frustration, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Like, uh, and that wasn't even one of the things that I, I noted. Like, it could just be she would exactly right, frustrated that she couldn't find that job, or, or it could be frustration at her father, right, because for all we know, like, she's in, still in the back of her mind saying, I got married, why can't my father be happy for my marriage now, and my success that I have a PhD, and, and she's just frustrated at, at her father still, so uh, are there any other um, and saying I, 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 I think I still think she's very interesting. So, all right. Well, then uh, th there's good news. Then, like uh, after she put all of her work on hold, ap after that, three years later, she got a job finally as a theater and uh, science reporter for a newspaper. So, uh, she was very excited about that because she got to write about the latest achievements in science and technology. So some of those at the time, remember this is 1878, so some of the things that were just being invented are the flying machine. So she's she writing about the first 
people to to fly and get off the ground or she was writing about the typewriting machine yeah and she was writing about the telephone and solar heaters and that type of thing so ah uh, So, but she liked writing about that type of stuff because it was in the realm of science and math and technology and probably like figuring out how all the gadgets that she was writing about work probably did stim stimulate her mind while she uh, was told, hey, you can't find a job. But that's interesting that you said that, asked about if she really liked that because Besides being a mathematician, she actually was known as a writer later in life. She wrote like two plays and uh, several books and published like, you know, like at least 20 journal articles and things like that. So she was a writer also. So that all came up later in life. And, and even, but she had, she had issues even becoming a writer because she did it while she was in Sweden, but she actually was Russian, but she was writing it in German because she was in Germany for so long. So she was in Sweden writing in German, but she was Russian. So now you can imagine why some of the translations of the book are, are, are even hard to figure out sometimes like what she was trying to say. Because going back and forth between that many languages is, is I'm sure, tremendously um, tremendously difficult like it, it, I, I can't imagine because I um, I get confused in my mind going back and forth between two languages so I, I just uh, I wouldn't want to even think about what's going on in in her mind on top of all the mathematics that she knew and was thinking about why are there like 40 messages now <laughs> okay great so now in addition to writing for the newspaper, she actually helped to organize something called the Higher Courses for Women, envisioned by its founders as the nucleus of a women's university. And this is where I say, right? I mean, she was actually volunteering to do this for free, and she was willing to work at the university for free once it got started. And she, but she was doing this partially for her own good because she wanted to be a university professor. And if they weren't going to hire her, right, she was just going to start her own school and, and work at her own school. But they wouldn't even hire her to work at the own, her own school that she helped organize and create, even though she said she would do it for free. And that's what you were talking about earlier, right? That, like, that's just, well, it doesn't make sense. So, so let's talk about that for a minute. Like, how, how do you think that made her feel, or how, you know, from maybe personal experience, does it feel to be passed over for a promotion or something like that, that you know that you deserve? And... Uh, yeah, yeah, invalidated. So this probably made her feel even more invalidated than she probably already was. Already was. So, I mean, that. So to know like all that that she went through, and then she feels even more invalidated. She's already frustrated as can be, and then, yeah, she can't even teach at her own school. So there's something not quite. <laughs> Yeah, so she keeps on doing more and more for her society, more and more for her homeland of, of uh, Russia to try to make things different there. And it doesn't work. And that's what I think, you know, like, I think that you can even think about today and how it, it's different today because, because social movements spread a little bit more quickly today because of the internet and because of, of, of Twitter and Facebook and social media. Social movements just spread quick. I mean, they start spreading more quickly even with the television coming out and things like that. But remember, she was just writing about the telephone, right? And so they, they, they were, like, trying to just be on the cusp of, like, a social movement. And so they really couldn't organize very well. 
and even with the telegram and the typewriting machine coming up, there were still problems with that. And that and part of that's actually uh, part of the story of how her life ended, and we'll get to that later on in a, in a minute also. So, so there was that down moment. Um, in the uh, in her in her life, but <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. Like so now now I now I think you're getting the sense like that I got that that this is actually a like a very clever woman, right? I mean she like to do all this, like I said, it started with stealing a algebra book, then having an a uh, fake marriage. Like she was a very clever woman. Like she actually used everything that she had to her advantage, but she never got to put her stamp on anything. You're exactly right. And so it is like sort of owning a home but never getting to live in it almost. But the good news is that later this year, uh, 1878, she had a daughter. So, you know, after <laughs> they got that married and, and they got over her, her now husband's uh, fear of her getting pregnant, they had a daughter named Fufa, uh, and so here's the strange part. They immediately put her daughter under the care of relatives and friends so that she could go back to work in mathematics. <laughs> so, uh, I know, and that's what I think makes her such an interesting woman, like, hey, because, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so that's how she escaped having to take care of the child, like, she left the child with her family and friends. And so, you know, like she saw the child off and on for like two years, but it wasn't really again until the her daughter is eight years old until she actually spent real time with her again. So that's just like what like what is going on with this lady, right? Exactly. That's another point. Like so maybe because she yeah, that's all she knew was a little bit of neglect. In, in whatever it might be. So maybe she neglected her daughter because it's like all she knew was from her father. Oh, I got neglected from, by my father. This is how it's supposed to be. Right. So um, it, it's, it, you're right. I mean, I just thought that this is just uh, the most bizarre thing that could happen. So, but the, on, the, on the good side for her, she resumed her work in mathematics, right? But then her husband Vladimir left her. <laughs> so he left her for a position as a docent at Moscow University, but he still kept a local job as at an industrial expansion company. So he was commuting back and forth, back and forth, but he really was away most of the time. Right, so he was away at Moscow University. Her child is with relatives and friends. So she's pretty much all alone. And then, wait, what year was that? Uh, 1880. So then it took three years until 1883 when, when Sophia finally said, I've had enough. Your extended absences are too much for me. It's taking a toll on our marriage. The marriage that you weren't even sure you wanted to begin with. And so Vladimir, he started like, getting really upset at, at her for making all these comments toward her. And he started having mood swings. And with being faced with the possibility of being prosecuted for 
a role in a, a stock uh, swindle because he got caught up in some shady business with the uh, industrial expansion company. He actually um, was not very happy when when Sophia used the, it, this Russian idiom calling him stiller than water and lower than grass. So I, that's not a, an idiom that you hear <laughs> here today, but I mean, it's, it's a pretty powerful idiom and it, it probably, you know, like if he's already down on his luck, like for possibly being prosecuted part of a stock swindle, and then she's saying, I might want to leave you for good because you're gone too often. This isn't very helpful. And so she actually realized he was getting depressed, but then instead of helping him, she start berating him even more and saying, you're weak of character. I can't believe you have this mental illness that, that's causing you to be depressed. And so what did he do? He committed suicide. You knew it? <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, I mean, but, but this is interesting that, that after all that she went through, that she was all of a sudden the one berating him, saying, like, you're stiller than water and lower than grass. You are weak of character. Why? Why are you depressed? Right? Okay, so here's the even more ironic part about all of this. She actually was berating him, but when she found out that he committed suicide, she tried to commit suicide herself by starving herself to death. And then she collapsed after five days. Somebody found her in, the, in her room at the dormitories where she was at, at the university, and then gave her some food, and she survived all of this. All right, so... Yeah. But when he's gone, she don't want him to be gone. She want him in her face. And when he's in her face, she don't want him. I feel like she just like look. She pushed her well once to the side. But this is the same thing you were describing with the math. When the math was right within her reach, she didn't want it. When the love was right within her reach, she didn't want it. Like, all these good things are coming to her, and then she pushes them away. She pushes an education away. She pushes love away. Right? She's pushing her family away. Like, all of the stuff is coming toward her that's good. You think it was just for attention? I think she wants her father to, like, care about her. But she do all this effort. So she her father, oh, my daughter is need help. Let me go check on her. I don't know. She's just like, oh, she loves her daughter. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, and so, yeah, he does actually love her, her the oldest daughter, her sister, a lot more, right? Any other comments about that? Or maybe just in general, like, um, like if a situation like this happened to you, or, or can you think of situations like this that have occurred um, where things could have been different, or what do you think maybe could have been done different here or or um, or do you feel like if if uh, we lived in a society or even if she didn't live in 1800 uh, Russia yes that's what it is yeah and so the things that she didn't like about herself uh, she projected onto him and it showed right absolutely like, I just, I mean, this is just one twist and turn after the other, right? So, uh, she just further study. However, this is right after she sur like, survived. That's when she secured her position as a private docent at Stockholm University in Sweden. So, that was a private docent is where she actually doesn't get pay until, uh, until after she works there for a year and uh, uh, proves herself, essentially. Yeah, intern almost. All right. So she was actually, 
Yeah, she could be paid yeah, for private tutoring, but not for her actual job of teaching that she had. Which... <laughs> Uh, no, no, but uh, but at that point, her husband is dead, and I'm I'm almost guessing that her uh, money that she got from the newspaper work and all of that kind of helped her out, and that her father actually um, at, at this point, I think that her her sister, older sister, sending her some of the family money because her father wouldn't give it to her directly. But then there was a whole a whole uh, other issue with that later down the line too. And then finally the father actually said, hey, you do have my blessing to marry the, this guy. Yeah. Yeah. But even though the, the job didn't pay very much uh, she did start a friendship with Anne, her uh, new friend, Anne Charlotte Egren Leffler. And so this is the uh, actress and in the, in the novelist and the play, playwright that she partnered with to do a lot of her work in literature and in journalism later on in her life. But the bad news, of course, is that meanwhile, while she's doing all of this, like, uh, one of her plays actually only played for one night because it got such bad reviews that they actually said, uh, your reviews are so bad, we're never playing your play again. It's canceled. Yes. And then on top of that, they attacked her in the same newspaper for being a woman mathematician. So they really were all over her, like her, her writing was bad, we don't like that you're a woman mathematician, and all of these things that she liked, she liked writing, she liked math, mathematics, they were attacking her for it, but, but she still went on anyway. So, uh, eventually, she, uh, the very next year, like after her one year was up, she was appointed to a five-year position as an assistant professor. She became the editor of the Acata um, Mathematica, so the journal, and was one of the first women to work for a scientific journal as an editor, which, of course, they let her do because of all of the, the journalism that she had uh, done as part of the newspaper. So that experience actually did pay off for her, even though it was a two-year stint in Russia because it was the only job that she could get. So that's why sometimes like, I, I think any experience that somebody has, if it, if it looks good for a resume or whatever, like she was still one of those women who really just uh, took, used everything that she could to her advantage. All right, so she was actually on a all-time high again because she got the job as uh, an assistant professor. But then, four years later, one year before she was actually done with that five-year appointment, she fell in love with a distant relative of her deceased husband, Vladimir. <laughs> I, I know this is, uh, it doesn't get any crazier than this, because he insisted on, uh, on marrying her and kept on asking, except that she had to guarantee that she would give up her work and move back to Russia with him and never do mathematics ever again, ever again in her life. All right, now, remember, though, she's still in Sweden. She wanted to live in Russia, but she wanted to do work. So what, at this point, she has a choice. Does she go back to Russia and live scot-free the rest of her life with this distant relative of her deceased husband? Or does she stay and work one more year and hopefully get reappointed? Because after the five years, she was going to be out of a job. 
and then she went went back to Russia and and wrote for the newspaper again or something, right? So I, so she knew that was a possibility. But all right, so this is where it gets even more strange, right? So she was considering like packing up and leaving and uh, going to marry him, moving back to Russia, giving up everything. But she was in the middle of uh, uh, being a part of a math competition in France. So she had already applied to be in the competition. So she would have actually dropped everything. She would not have actually been able to be in the competition. So she didn't marry him. And then she won the competition. And they actually upped the prize by, uh, uh, what was it, like 40%. They upped the prize money to 40% because they liked her submission so much. And that was the largest prize they had ever given out for that award. And it hadn't even been given out the three years immediately before she got it at the award because there weren't any good enough submissions. So she yeah i know like this yeah this is like i'm like this is really crazy that all of a sudden like out of nowhere like she like she made the right decision here in my opinion right i mean because i but she did have a tough decision to make all right so <laughs> Yeah, that, that makes sense. I, 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 so you wouldn't just give it up because of, you know, you never know that he's going to be around forever, right? I mean, he could divorce you, anything can happen. You're exactly right. So you're pretty good, crazy, though. Maxim, like the, the, uh, the potential husband, gave her this ultimatum, but then even when she didn't take it, she... she um, still kept on talking to him and he kept on responding back so they were still talking and that made things even more awkward because like he gave her this ultimatum said if you either marry me and give everything up or not and then they kept on talking anyway so then he while they were talking tried to convince her that after your last year's hub up you're in your fifth year then you could move closer to me back in russia and i'll i'll compromise and let you keep on working but she couldn't find a job in mathematics in russia so she stayed in in sweden and well she was appointed to a full professor which meant that she could have this job as long as she wanted for the rest of her life. This was a lifetime appointment. Yeah, so after all of this, she finally got what she wanted in 1889. And so she was the first woman ever to be appointed to this sort of professorship. And then she was made a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences. But they actually had to make a change in the rules even to let her her into the Academy of Sciences, but then even when she was in the Russian Academy of Sciences, which meant that you should be guaranteed to be able to teach as a professor in Russia, and they even changed their rules to let her in, they still wouldn't let her teach in Russia. So, so what does what do you guys make of that? That they changed the rules for her, but then still won't let her in to the job that she wanted. So you think do you think it was just like um, they gave her the title? Just uh, you can change the rules, but it takes a while to change the And actually, I think that's why I think that I have a lot of respect for her because she actually put down the groundwork to make things a lot easier for people who want it to actually push later because the rules were already changed because of her. So, it's, so. <laughs> yes.
<laughs> exactly. Oh no, I get, I get, yeah, I, I get, does everyone agree but with still that? Still, the old guys, but you can't believe women should be running everything. Yeah. Still running everything. So that's the problem. Yeah, it's, it's, it, and so, it, but. It, the good news, though, is for her that she got the rules changed. And I think that's the thing that, that was one of her accomplishments, yeah. right? So, um, uh, so the, actually, yes, there is one, the, oh, I forget her name, but she's mentioned in the, in the book that is uh, a woman mathematician who actually quoted her as being one of uh, sort of in a sense of the way it described almost like a mentor to her so yes so there are women under her who came along so yeah which is interesting that you mentioned that because uh, the um, that first year that she worked in Sweden uh, for free, she actually taught her her classes in German because that's what she knew at the time because she had spent most of her time in G Germany and then she taught all the rest of the years in, in uh, Swedish and, and you can imagine like uh, she didn't know the language very well still and so she was working with her friend Anne Charlotte on all of these non-mathematical works, her book, uh, two plays, an autobiographical novel. And um, she actually just verbally told Anne Charlotte a lot of this stuff, and she translated it into Swedish because she didn't, uh, uh, Sophia didn't know all the Swedish words yet. So that's another thing that the fact that she wrote all these memoirs out is amazing because it, it was dictated almost to somebody who knew the language better than she did. So now we're, we're, we're headed for the big yeah, yeah, well, yeah, but I'm going to tell you the good news first. <laughs> the good news is that she got to go on a New Year's Day vacation so that her friend Anne Charlotte could finally meet Maxim the the guy that had been her love interest all these years uh, her, her, her daughter is still long gone <laughs> now if, if you thought her daughter was by herself now just wait yeah yeah it, 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 so remember how i said that there was trouble with the technology in the t at that time so Anne Charlotte never got the telegram about where to meet for the meeting. Yeah, she didn't know where, where they were supposed to meet because she never got the telegram. So then uh, um, Sophia and Maxim like sort of uh, just decided to hang out by themselves on New Year's Day, walk around a cemetery, of all things. I mean, I found that kind of bizarre and look at gravestones and uh, think about the past together. And then, because it got so late, Sophia had to go back to um, uh, Sweden in the, in the middle of the night so that she could get back in time to teach her classes after the New Year. But she got stuck in Denmark with no Danish money. So she couldn't actually pay anyone to carry her bag, but it was raining. Imagine it being, you know, in Denmark, it's cold, it's New Year's, it's rainy. So she carried her, her bag in the rain. The next morning she woke up and she was extremely sick. But 
she felt good enough, to, uh, she felt well enough to go teach her classes anyway. All right, this is where her pneumonia was misdiagnosed as a kidney colic. I mean, well, yeah, I, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's not funny, but it is kind of, in a way, ironic, after, like, because it kind of summarizes, like, all of the mishaps of her entire life would be like, like this is just another, like, uh, like um, couldn't something have went right for this lady that, that uh, she could have been saved from dying of pneumonia? But, but no, she was misdiagnosed as having a kidney colic. So she finally died in 1891 at the age of 41. Now, if you think about that, though, like uh, everything that I've said, can you believe that all of this happened in, in just 41 years? Right? That's another amazing thing in itself because uh, a lot of the, um, you know, mathematicians probably, a lot of the ones that you see as is, is being the famous ones are in their 50s and 60s and later in life they're, doing a lot of their, what they consider their better work, but that's because they've been spending years and years and years and years on it. She had a short 41 years to do everything that, that she did. So uh, she was buried in, in Sweden, actually. So, <laughs> well, I mean, she, she I know it's, uh, that is the sad part, is that she didn't get buried in, in Russia, so she never actually even made it back to Russia, even though it was her dream to live in Russia and be a professor of mathematics in Russia. She never even made it back to her home country. So, uh, you know, there were a lot of ups and and, and downs in her life, but uh, but there's also a lot of uh, what if comments. And I'll actually, well, does anyone have any comments before I? I I ask these hypothetical questions. I mean, at this point, I feel like it's kind of sad because it, like, she just died, and um, and uh, you have to think though, like, what if Sophia would have been born even a hundred years later? Right? I mean, that would have been the 1980s rather than the 1880s. Right, things like a hundred years isn't really a, a, a lot of time if you think about it, but because a lot of things change in a short one hundred years. Um, would she have went the same route of marriage? Like, would she have even got married at all? Would she have had a traditional marriage, an open marriage? And they talk about her possibly be, being open to a group marriage based on her uh, her. Uh, Well, yeah, polygamy. Yeah, it probably wouldn't bother. Yeah, I think for her, she probably wouldn't even bother. Yeah, I think she seems like the one that uh, she would have went straight for her education and figure out the marriage part later. But she only got married because she had to do it to get the education. So, uh, like, would would it have been easier for her to get a job? Like, would antibiotics have made her death unnecessary. Uh, so there's all these questions that you're just left to just ponder. And so the, the big question for me in the book that, that stood out is just asking, like, how would Sophia have addressed the issues of balancing love, freedom, identity, and commitment? Because love, freedom, identity, and commitment were all those things that she had issues with throughout her entire life. Like love, uh, between her parents and her family and her sister and and her husbands and and their boyfriend later on, her freedom to do whatever she wants, her sense of identity was she really a meant to be a housewife or, or meant to be a wife at all, or was she meant to be a working wife, or was she meant just to be a mathematician and not even married at all? Like who was she and where were her commitments in life? Were they to family or were they to uh, learning mathematics? So these are all the things that I think um, 
are difficult because you don't you don't know. And, and she only did live 41 years. So that really is a short amount of time. So, well, that's all I was going to say because it, I, I don't feel like there's a lot else to say given that that the you all know that she's gone now, and it was just. I mean, I, I sort of feel like uh, when you hear all these things and it builds up like that, then you, you sort of are disappointed that she she uh, died at such an early age without. And actually, I don't know if they actually heard like the last like five minutes of this because it seemed like it may have been on mute again. This, I actually did not press the mute button, by the way. 